Oh, wow. I did this did you, did you put the characters? No, I didn't do it. I was too worried about work. I didn't want to risk the mental energy, but I'll get on that. I can read all of it if you want me to. No, no, that's okay. No, I'm doing okay. Um, Excellent. Um, oh, yeah, characters. Well, so this one has a lot. Um, oh, does it? Yeah, and I was hoping we'd have enough readers, but yeah, no, all, three of the, our, all three of the people on the phone are also. Um, so we have Moses, God, narrator. So you're the narrator. And, I can do more than one. So do you want to be Moses or God? Do you want to do character? I'll be Moses. Moses? Okay. Then I'll be God. I'm not worthy. Um, and then we also have Jephthah and Zipporah. Um, do you want to be... Excuse me. Well, Zipporah is a girl. Okay. And then... Um, I, don't care the girl. <laughs> I can I can do Jethro. To you. But it will not change my voice. Yeah. <laughs> I will be a girly guy. <laughs> okay, ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Moses answered. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? Staff. He replied, The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into the staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and then, and when he took it out, it was leprous, like snow. Now put it back into your cloak. He said. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. If they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I'll help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform miraculous signs with it. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and son, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my first son go, so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. 
So I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But, but Zipporah? Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' his feet with it. Yeah. Oh, still me, huh? Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone, and that at that time she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the desert to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the miraculous signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had sent to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, when they believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Okay, so five we have. Um, you want to take a break there? Um, so we have narrator all the ways to keep the same roles. That's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Rick, I'll be a narrator. Darren, you still be Moses? Yeah. Okay. And it says Moses and Aaron in the text, but they kind of read this as one. I'll be the Pharaoh. Um, and then, Darren, do you want to be uh, the Egyptian slave drivers? Sure. Yeah, um, and then I'll be the Israelite overseers. We're good. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, "This is what the Lord." What? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Stolen. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says: <clears throat> Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, I guess I'll hold it for Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous. You are stopping them from work. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in, in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce their quota. They're lazy. And that is why they're crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working. And pay no attention to lies. And then the slave drivers and the foreman went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. The Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked, Why didn't... Oh, wait. Yeah, that's the Israelites here. Why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh. And why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, Lazy. That's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. Mm -hmm. The Israelite foreman realized they were in trouble when they were told, You are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. 
When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, Okay, mm -hmm. Sure. May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they lived as aliens. Moreover, I heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say this to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And with mighty acts of judgment, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of this country. But Moses said to the Lord, The Israelites will not listen to me. Why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? <clears throat> now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Um, and then, yeah, we, we can skip the names. Um, the, the heads of the families, um, it just goes through the, each one of the 12 tribes and says who their names were. Um, it also says that, um, who are some, 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 uh, where are they? Who are the clan of Levi? Oh, so the. Here, I'll read this part 20. In, uh, so we're in Exodus 6. Um, I guess we didn't say on Facebook Live. We're in Exodus 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 20. It says, Amram married his father's sister. Amram is Moses' dad. So Amram married his aunt, Jochebed, who bore him Aaron and Moses. And Amram lived 137 years. And we'll skip down. These were the heads of the clans of the family, clan by clan. And then in 26. It was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. And now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, Actually, um, Actually, that's kind of a weird break for a chapter. That's a better break up here. We can stop there, take a break, unless you guys want to read one more. You want to read one more? Let's see if we have any questions. No questions. Um, yeah, let's keep going. We'll do one more. All right. Um, I don't know what we'll oh, did you say four, five, and six? We just read four, five, and six? Yeah, it was short. Oh. We can, we'll do one more and then we'll stop after that. If I fall over, just pick me up and work me to read. No, we're good. You want to be a narrator? Yeah. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, In Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. Wait, where are you? 28. 
I mean, I don't know. Well, I started right on seven. Okay. But yeah. So yeah you, but you went, you went and read it again. I'm confused. Oh, we he decided to break it early because yeah, that little section what? is called Aaron to speak for Moses. Is it oh, say the same okay. thing in Bible? I thought yeah. we had already. Okay. But you'll say, but Moses said to the Lord. But Moses said to the Lord. Since I speak with faltering lips, wait. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I thought I just read that. You're going to let your lips fall today. I think we all read it in our heads. We kept going. And now we're confused. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to sell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the... Lord, when I stretch out my hand against Egypt, bring the Israelites out of it. God said that twice. He said that Pharaoh, he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He said it twice. Mm -hmm. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, uh, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing, things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would listen, he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to get water. Wait in the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, The Lord, the God of Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, Let my people go, so that they may worship me in the desert. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds, and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars. When Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and stuck the water, struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. Maybe yeah. Whew. Okay, I'm going to take five. What's up, Mark? You look tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I worked with two kids today. And how's that? Well, one is very demanding of attention. <laughs> it's just the normal one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the autistic boy was very high energy after school. He gave me a hug today, which was the first time since I've met him. And then he fed me chips. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, it was really cute. It was special to me because that's the first time he's 
I mean, he recognizes me now. He waves at me. He does, he's nonverbal autistic. So he, he waves at me now, and he, and he uh, clings on to me when we cross the street because I get him off the bus. And then uh, one time I babysat him, he, or I watched him, he just stayed on the couch all day and he was shy. He wouldn't, like, really connect with me, wouldn't really talk or try to talk or do anything. And I couldn't even get him to go to the bathroom or get off the couch. Um, so today was really good. Today was we were eating chips and and he was he like I went like this to his chin because that's what my dad used to do to us. Like he used to reach over and just like touch my chin. And I do that to my kids all the time. And so I did it to him just to see, like just to see what would happen. And then he looked at me and he's like, got all like his eyes get all like lovey dovey and then like he came over and he hugged me. And I was like, Oh, it's the first thing you ever hugged me. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Really sweet. Yeah. And then he and then he likes to feed his sister and his mom. Like so he grabs the chips and he starts feeding. And I was like, oh thank you. And you don't need to feed it to me. I'll grab it. <laughs> wow. See, my sister is the opposite. She'll grab all the food for herself and play with it. Really he food. was doing that too. He was like he was grabbing his chips and like mushing them up and then stuffing them in his mouth. I'm like, oh that's interesting. My <laughs> sister would mush it up and like and it looked like a tornado went through the house of food <laughs> all over the walls and ceiling. <laughs> yeah, she was laughing, had lots of fun after that. Yeah, it was a good day. It was a good day. Mm-hmm. Well, any comments over what we've read? Why did he repeat it so many times? Mm-hmm. Which one? <laughs> Why did God repeat what he said so many times? Where which part? On the part about Pharaoh. Oh harden his heart. Oh harden his heart. Mm-hmm. Um well maybe 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 Moses and Aaron didn't believe him? Um, no. I think that the petition. If if Usually when it's repeated, it means it's like there's an emphasis on it. Um, but a lot of times, I think it really has to do with the way Middle Easterners write. And we don't, we don't write in that way. We, we write um, linear, in a linear fashion. We don't repeat at all. Um, and Russians do this too. But they, um, they'll, they'll say, they'll, they'll have a long narrative. This is what the Lord wants you to say, and say all this thing, and then the very next chapter, it says the exact same thing, and you're like, ooh, you're reading this twice. So as for application, we just get that it's really, um, it, yeah, it was a really important, it's like watching the, the State of the Union address twice, or something like that, you know, it's something that affects a large number of people, and hear the narrative, and, and sometimes it'll repeat when the narrative switches, so, Let's go to that actual spot where it says that. Um, I will harden his heart. Okay, so it's a harden his heart in 421, but I will harden his heart so he will not let the people go. And then it says it again in 5. Right? Mm-hmm. No, in six. Seven. Just write it in seven again. Okay. Or maybe it was six. No, it wasn't. It wasn't seven because I read it. I read it and then stopped. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He will not listen to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 7-3, but I'll harden Pharaoh's heart. Yeah. yeah God, God said it twice. I don't understand why God chose to harden Pharaoh's heart. That that actually is is a very, that's a lot deeper theologically. I think it has less to do with the way the text is written and more to do with what's going on. So, the best, um, oh, we have a bunch of comments. Oh. Oh, oh, uh, I'll address Mark in a second. Do my comment or do my question? No, um, well, if you want to wait till Darren gets back so we can all talk about it. Yeah, you can answer Darren's question if you want. 
No, that's a good question. Mark says, I have a question. If the Lord was going to harden Pharaoh's heart anyway, what was the purpose of having Moses perform the plagues? To show his power? That's a good question, Mark. <laughs> question of Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, okay, no. Like the lion and the cheetah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I get... I guess... Well, okay. Well, we'll, 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 we'll figure it now. If he comes back, we'll repeat it. But so, um, the best explanation I've heard of that was actually from Pastor Mark Driscoll, um, which um, we've talked. Mark, we've talked about Pastor Mark Driscoll before. And <laughs> we've uh, we've definitely been critic. I think I remember critiquing his um, um, Calvinist style, but he did have a really good. Um, um, he led Marysville well Church up in Seattle, but. Um, it's very, very popular. Um, he created the Reformed Church. Anyway, um, it's to appeal to younger people, kind of the style of churches nowadays. God used him to part that up. But in one of his sermons, in public speaking, he goes, um, yes, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but he didn't do it in the way that it seems like. Like we would harden somebody's heart. When we'd harden somebody's heart, we'd be mean to them. So their heart would get back and they'd lash out back against us. The way that God Pharaoh's heart is he was kind to him. And Pharaoh already didn't like God and he didn't love God and he was already mad. And so what God was doing is um, he's kind of bringing that to life. He's like, I'm going to be gentle with you. You've got to let my people go. And that kindness made him want to be unkind all the more. And then he kept being kind and kept being kind. And, you know, the Pharaoh sitting there still like, you're being so nice, you know, just showing showing his true nature. And so the way Pastor Mark Driscoll says, has you ever been nice to somebody and it made them mad at you? And then you were even nicer to them and it made them even madder at you? And it's, we've, all, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's in the same way. So And that's that's that happens in the Passover, too. And I hope that helps, Mark. Um, hmm. Um, in the in the yeah in the Passover too, um, God kills the firstborn son. But the way He does it is He lets the demon of death do its thing. And yes, God created angels; He knew that they were going to turn into demons. But God isn't down there with a the sword, you know, killing people. He's letting death. He's That's so. Okay, I understand. Why do you have to come kill all the firstborn? Why couldn't He just? Like, why do you have to kill any of the kids? Like, right. That's that's the amount of pride that Pharaoh had. Even if his own... So, like, if you're a commander in the military, the worst thing that you can do is have your soldiers die. The soldiers that are entrusted in you to live. And that's how bad Pharaoh was. He would even sacrifice his own people in order to support his stubbornness of his heart. You know, that's Satan right there. And I don't remember, did anything change after after God killed his son? He let him go. He was overwhelmed. He let him go. He let all the people go? And then, and once again, okay. yeah. Okay, I remember. And then once again, Satan came back and tempted his heart again, and he just, he took it all back, and he went after them. And that's when he perished. And so it really was his own doing. He perished himself. He followed people into the, you know, the, the Red Sea, with high water on either side wrongfully and uh god was using nature to split it apart and he led his people in i'm sure his people didn't want to go and he killed his entire egyptian force just for the pride of one man <laughs> pride, yeah pride kills but that's also a good application point because um what's up jordan um but that's a good application part that when we're prideful and we're in the wrong, we got to learn to stop right away because that pride will kill, you know. And that's that's what the anger I'm dealing with all the time. It's like, it's like I will suffer harm to remain angry. I'm like, that's just wrong, you know, that's bad. And so it's like, okay, well, um, the devil, the devil already hates God, and if he gets us to, um, Side with them even for a moment, it will it'll, it'll be destructive, anyway. Yeah, so we should 
and not to be prideful. And be prideful as shortly as possible and immediately return to God. Um, or uh, what was that one quote? It was like, did this Jason up to or something? Anyway, one of the um, real good spiritual people, he goes, we have to learn to, oh no, that was Rick Joyner um, in his book, The Dirge Reading. He goes, we have to learn to go to God while we're in the midst of sin and not run from it. Like Adam and Eve in the garden. It's the hardest thing to do. Right, say that again. It says that we have to learn to run to God when we're in the midst of sinning. Like when we're in the midst of the sin, we have to learn to go to him immediately during it. Because if we don't, um, like in Exodus, that hard heart that we get from sin can lead to the death and destruction. So the firstborn of Egypt dying and uh, being go, going into the Red Sea and just dying. Even just from pride. Okay. Wait, and that's in the same book that I'm reading? <laughs> yeah. We just talked, yeah, we just talked about her question was um why why did God harden Sparrow's heart? Oh, oh man, I missed all the good stuff and I left. Yeah, no, that's okay. I can That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, any well, thoughts? Yeah, what was your answer? Well, um <laughs> so he God killed him with kindness. Um God was gentle to him and he already had a hateful heart. And God was kind to him. He wasn't powerful and he didn't overpower him, but he was like, let my people go. And then Pharaoh was like, no. And every time he, God was kind to him like and, and gentle. Like a kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's really prideful. He, he, just, he already had a hard heart. And so it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But what it really means is that God showed the whole world how hard his, how hard his heart already was. Um, God could have easily just sent the angel of death to kill just him. Excuse me. No. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Anyway, Mike, I hope that helps. You got some comments? I need to call it. Yeah, he, yeah, Mark, from Mark from Arizona, he asked the same thing about the hardening of the heart. So hard passage is like, who can resist God's will? What if he hardened my heart right now? And then I get thrown into hell or something like that. How is that fair? Well, God's just. You know, we know that he is he has a better sense of justice than we do. So when we think that he's being unjust, we're usually we're reading it wrong. Um, and in this case, it is. It's not that he's unjust. He's not hardening somebody's heart in order to destroy him because he wants to destroy Pharaoh. He wants Pharaoh to do the right thing. Um, but he's also letting him have a hard heart. The devil's behind that. The real answer is the devil's behind the Pharaoh. And that's the reason why the Israelites are in Trump. And Pharaoh said that he didn't know God. Yeah, who is this God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, every time we sin, we get separate from God. We know God less. We miss an opportunity to know him. He was yeah, trying to prove that God wasn't real by using his little people. Yeah, and even when it wasn't true, he's mm -hmm. still like, I'm not going to believe it. Who is more blind than, than, what's more blinding than hate? You know, atheists, they have a problem with believing in God. And it's mostly because they have a problem with the all loving God, loving them. And whatever's tripping them up, Satan is using them that disbelief to go, no. You know, it's a hard heart, which leads to disbelief. It's still funny. You think that belief is just a mathematical thing, but it has more to do with the heart than anything else. Mm -hmm. Believing in you know, like believing that God will um, view my brain and, and overcome my anger and stuff like that. There are days when I just don't believe that, you know, and, and that's that's when I struggle the most. Well, faith is a heart issue, not a head issue. Mm -hmm. He's clearly doing it, so <laughs> it's not logic. Um, but the devil is not wise. He's smart, but he's not wise. Because it takes respect of the Lord in order to gain wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, um, that was a lot. Any other? <laughs> Does that make sense? Or yeah, okay. yeah. I guess it's easy to like when you're reading this, you'll be like, "What?" Like it'll <laughs> you'll interpret something like that doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> like, it's, like it's against logic, and then but if you read on some more, it'll say something that opposes that. Mm. Like in this case, you know, it's it sounds like God's hardening his heart. Mm. But you'll read later on in the Bible 
that it says that he he desires for everyone to come to repentance, like everybody, every single person. Mm. Yeah. So it's like what these words are like seem like they're contradictory or uh totally. Yeah, my seminary professor used to say, be comfortable with conflict, internal conflict. That's kind of, you know, the word of God's purpose is to divide soul and spirit, divide our hearts and get as you said, conflict. Um but there is something that I've found that I think works a little better. Other than being comfortable with being having reading conflicting things, there's a couple of themes that I rely on when I hear those conflicts. So the first thing that I learned about starting back in Genesis and starting seminary is it's all it's all about the heart, the heart of the matter, the heart of the characters, the heart of the issue. It's all about the heart, and it's a lot much about the external things. And so when something doesn't make sense, we have to go, okay, where is the character's heart? You know, where are his emotions? Um, another thing that helps me with that is that it's not, and these are things, it's not what the Bible says, it's what it doesn't say. So here in the Pharaoh situation, where is the Pharaoh's heart? Well, it already was hard, so we can see that. The second thing that we learn is that, um, uh, oh, there's also character development. So we see Moses gets more righteous over time, but right now he's unrighteous, and God was even going to kill him because of the unrighteousness. He ends up being the most humble man on earth. So about character development. Um, I think we're really cool to be on the earth. Yeah, he, so God was going to kill him because he wouldn't circumcise his, his son, right? Um, so his wife did it. Yeah, but she took the foreskin of his son and wiped it on him. Um, is that part of like the ritual too, or that that's a really good question. I had to look that one up, and um, it says it goes back to so that's a reference. She did that in reference back to the Abraham's covenant, and the Abraham's covenant. One of the first things God says is, um, well, first of all, when there's a covenant, God like a smoking pot or a flaming torch that's being put out in the water, the smoke, the spirit of God walked through two animals that were cut in half. I think there were three of them, like a pigeon, a ram, something would count. And God God went through it. And what that saying is, is that um, this is a covenant of blood. If you don't follow my covenant, it will mean death to you. Um, and there's a good reference in Deuteronomy, which talks about if we don't obey the Lord, we die. But anyway, in Moses' circumstance, he grew up in the Egyptian family, and I don't think he was circumcised. Um, and it says in the Abraham covenant, anybody, this is what's going to be our sign that I'm going to make a nation out of you. You guys are going to be circumcised. That's your, that's your thing. Um, and if you don't do that, you'll be cut off from my people. So right there, Moses is doing the work of a priest, and he's getting close to God. And suddenly God's going to kill him. That means he messed up somewhere. And I, it was circumcision. So she cuts off the foreskin of the sun, wipes it on his feet, and basically, like, he, she's saying he is a bridegroom of blood to me, which means that um, she's carrying out the act of circumcision, and they're bound to each other by blood. And she's like, don't take his life. He is blood of my blood, and when we're not going to do the circumcised thing. So it was, it was a warning. Um, but it was a harsh warning. Does that make sense? Uh, the wife was warning him? The, the God was warning him. Like, if you don't follow me, you're going to die. Um, and so Moses woke up, and Zipporah, you know, the next day, I only imagine Moses woke up, and he was like, honey, why didn't you sleep? And she was like, God was here. It's like, oh, yeah, what was he doing? He was going to kill you. Is that makes sense like they're in a tent together they're traveling to egypt mm -hmm. um maybe maybe we should read back the passage okay so he was sleeping when when god was going to kill him here we go four yeah 420 <laughs> chapter 4 verse 24. <laughs> for what 424. sorry that was probably in the middle of it at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. She says, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So the Lord 
in turn, let him or let him live, I think would be maybe a good translation too. At the time, she said bridegroom of blood, re referring to circumcision. So, okay. Yeah, I didn't say too much in there. Mm -hmm. It sounds like when she's saying, surely you are a bride, groom of blood, she's insulting him. Kind of sounds like to me. Oh, yeah? Huh. Oh, okay. Know, like he's good as dead or something? I don't know. Oh, yeah, sometimes blood refers to death, like, you're you're just future blood. Your blood's gonna be spilled. Yeah, here here I think what she's mean, I see her cutting off her son's foreskin and like wiping it on his feet and then like holding it and going like Moses, he's a bridegroom of blood to me. Like he's mine. He's mine. Uh, I'll do this circumcision thing. Um so blood like as in like we're blood. We're like we're blood now. We're married, you know. And even even sex with that it within marriage, like even that, there's a constant flow of blood to where um, the two people are exchanging blood, and um, yeah, so you know, it's, it's a it's the most intimate thing you can do, um, and she's using that to refer to circumcision back to the earlier covenant where God says. What happens if the son takes to private? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It just, yeah. Yeah. And that's another good thing that I learned about. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't mention it again. So like, yeah. He sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah. And so we don't know if the son survived. I mean, during circumstances, there's every reason to believe he did. But we don't know what's happening to the family along with you. But another thing that God was showing me is that. Here we have a split in the narrative, and Zipporah, um, yeah. yeah, anyway. Sorry, I had to move from that. No, it's okay. Um, the reason why the narrative splits is because we hear Moses, and it's, it's about Moses, it's all about Moses, and suddenly Moses is unrighteous, and so it's about Aaron, too. And then suddenly the wife is mentioned. So whenever you have a split where a wife is mentioned, um, and that, and it's she's doing something more righteous than what the husband is doing, and so well, yeah. Your husband, she saved her husband's life using her son. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was her righteousness. Yeah, yeah one of the a quote from that book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a division. Wait. No. What's the name of that? That means I haven't read it in a long time. The book that you gave me. No, oh, uh, the, the call. The call. The division. The oral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah, like one of my favorite quotes from there is um, it's titled, yeah, uh, Living Like a King. But the author, like, he was feeling guilty because, um, like, he wasn't, like, wealthy. Like an Americanized, but like compared to most of the world, yeah, or even people 100 years ago, he was living like a king, basically living better than, better than kings 100 yeah. years ago. <laughs> so then he like looked at all this, he like thought of all the stuff that he has at home, and then he started feeling guilty. But at the same time, he felt he felt good about that guilt, but at the same time, bad, like confusion. Like, I don't know. So then he looked at the Lord, and the Lord said that uh, his his uh. What does it say? His truth is, or his uh, light. Oh, I can't remember what it says. Basically, like, it's okay. there's either light or darkness. Like, there's no in between. Like, anything in between that is, isn't of him. Yeah. Isn't of God. It's like, there's nothing to be confused about. Because God, basically, God, you know, he's perfect. He knows what's right and wrong. His perfect law of love, you know, is one or the other. Yeah. 
It's true. Like, yeah, so it's pretty cool. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So like when I'm reading through the Bible, I kind of like rest assured. And like if I don't understand something, I'm like, oh, I'm probably not ready for it yet. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, the um, Satan was trying to make the author guilty about the things that he owned. Um, but instead, God followed up. He said, and I, I remember that exact spot of the book. And God eventually like tells him, look, the things that I give you in life, I give them for you to enjoy. You know, these are bad. You know, he wants us to enjoy stuff. Um, and so when we when we give up those gifts and we say, no, no, it's in the same way, it's, it separates us from him. Because he was going to use that to bring pleasure in life. Oh, God is good. This is good. Food, like food is good. Sleep is good. Therefore, God must be good. You know, it's supposed to help us. And when we re reject the good things God is trying to give us, we separate ourselves from him. And we can do that out of a pious, uh, pious which means what, religious um, effort. Like, oh, I'm going to deny myself pleasure in this world. That's not the point of living. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like in places in the Old Testament, um, like God's talking about how, uh, like those people who live religiously, you know, they they fast like a lot, and, and God's saying it's more important for someone to like change their heart and to love others, you know, than to just fast all the time Isaiah and not love others. You know what I mean? Yeah, so oh, I say out of the heart, yeah. Yeah, and that's another good point with the the the, the cutting. We don't understand this passage. Why was God going to kill him? He just commissioned him to go do his good works. Well, it doesn't make sense why God would kill the person that he, that he just gave instructions to to do something. It's like what? But again, it's about the heart. There was something in Moses' heart that was bad. Zipporah's heart was more righteous than Moses's. And so she did an act out of the righteousness of, the, of her heart, of the goodness of her heart, and that changed God's heart. And so Moses wasn't circumcised in his heart. He had a hard heart. And if he had kept going without God doing that, he might have hardened his heart against God's instruction too. And then he might have not done one of the miracles that maybe Pharaoh would have killed him on the spot and lost God's protection. So at first I was like, this is crazy. You know, what if I mess up and God comes to kill me? But the real answer is that's not, not what God's going to do. Um, he, he's letting Moses know that obeying him is a matter of life and death. And, and the closer I get into the Lord with worship, the more severe my sin is, because I realize how destructive sin is. And when I get prideful and I get mad at God, it really affects things. It affects me for days. Um, and it affects him. And so Moses is about to get really close with God. And God's saying, obey me. I will preserve your life. If you don't, you will die. You need me. Um, and he didn't have a circumcised heart. And that's that's all over in Deuteronomy. It's in his Isaiah 60, uh, 60, the whole 59, 60, 61. It's all about not just being religious out of external things, but having a having a circumcised means a soft heart to God. Keep a soft heart to God. And I get angry, I harden my heart to God because I'm doing something I want him to do. Um, but that always harms me. So. I mean, that's a lot. You said a lot. You can cut me off mid sentence. You know. <laughs> Yeah, and I think in the same way, has there been times when you have to talk with Tony and Anna and be like, if you do this, you know, don't do this for your own sake, like, don't run in the street, you're, you will die. Yeah, I tell him all the time, don't drink her because you, you will die. Oh, <laughs> here you go. <laughs> I did it more to just scare them, but yeah. then I had to tell them, you know, it's more if you drink all the time or if you do drugs all the time, you're more likely to get addicted and, and you know die because of it and it's because you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. first it was just trying to put fear into them so they, they never try it mm -hmm. <laughs> it work yeah it worked for you know, two three years 
<laughs> now it's now the hat's off. I, I, I never drugs, so. I never did drugs though. The only thing I've ever drunk is pot, so mm -hmm. that's you know that's but alcohol, yeah. I you say it's alcohol. Yeah, I almost died when I did drugs. Yeah, you yeah. did. You yeah, almost I, died. I know yeah. I would die on the first. Really? Night. Yeah, I'm just doing drugs. Which one? <laughs> oh, I guess if you don't mind me asking. Yeah. Um, no, I won't say it because of the Facebook Live. <laughs> my, my heart heart kept racing, and my body couldn't catch up to itself. It was about to die. Um, and yeah, so I really truly believe that if I ever tried drugs, I would die on the first time. All the cigarettes and everything. That's good. Plus, yeah. it's just it's not for me. Like I never wanted to try it. Never. Good. It just seems to me like those, um, you know, a lot of people that seek, you know, to get high or or drunk, like they're kind of seeking, I guess, comfort for their, just to be relaxed or, you know, comfort, like mm -hmm. to, they're feeling depressed or something to feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think it's way better to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a part when I started doing drugs, it's because I wanted to feel good, but also wanted to harm myself. It's weird. You're like, well, nothing I'm trying in life is making me feel good. Might as well destroy myself while I feel good. It was, it was simple, like 100%. <laughs> no, it was totally wrong. Yeah, I knew I had it was wrong. So it's, um, Bad. But yes, that's good. Tony and Anne, that's that's good. Not in life and death. Yeah, I guess I didn't have to go into the whole drug and alcohol thing, but yeah, that's one of the biggest things. That's good. I try to teach Abby though. She's she's little, she's seven, but she has the Down syndrome, so she doesn't understand that, you know, she runs in front of a car. She's gonna get hit. Yeah, I know. She doesn't understand that. I have this. That's a lot of repetition, a lot of like, Addy, look, the car is bigger than you and it will smoke you. And that's what I taught my kids when they were little. But with Addy, I think I have to repeat it a lot more. And mm -hmm. do the stuff that comes to like, no. <laughs> yeah, weird stubbornness. <laughs> and the same way Moses was stubborn, Dad, no. Mm -hmm. I have a speech you better. Funny, um, uh, well, before I say this, Mark commented there and to, to you, he said, he agreed with you, with God there is no ambiguity, and any amount of darkness cannot stop the light. Oh, yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what he gives it. It gives me, like, another picture in my mind, you know, like, when lights, like, from the light, darkness can't hide from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's it's clearly clear. explaining it, yeah. Yeah, and that uh, also in that book it goes um, when you receive a word from God, it's not, it's not, it's not confusing. It doesn't make you numb or anything. It actually makes you very clear, very clear in thinking, and that's helped me through a lot. I wish I could remember. What people have like prayed over me. I had one that he prayed and she was giving it all the way, so I can't remember everything that she said. Everything's crystal clear in the moment. Mm -hmm. And it was a it's what I needed in that moment, yeah. Mm. And she was a very godly woman, so I really knew it was from God. Mm. But I can't remember. <laughs> like some people will be like, yeah, I just prophesied, or people prophesied over me and they remember everything that <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. Maybe it was something that was kind of in, in the moment. Was that at your church? Yeah, my other, my other church, my uh, the one on Portland Road. Uh, we the one on Portland Road. We uh, our our pastor kind of stepped down for a little while, and because he was really sick, so our church um, messed with another church. We we started all going to different church. A lot of us, a lot of them scattered to different churches. But a big group of a small group of us um, stayed with Connection Life where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. 
So we have a different match in there, but this side of the country is not a pastor anymore. Well, I still, he's still pastoring, but he just doesn't have a church. Um, final closing comments. Um, notice that Moses' dad married Moses' aunt. And Moses had, they think that Moses was so, talking about not wanting to speak so much because they had a speech impediment. And I thought it was funny that the dad married the aunt and the, one of his sons came out with a speech impediment. That's how handicap works to this day. You know, it's some sort of flaw in genetics. When you have genetics that are real close to each other, like intermarrying within the family, you have problems with the genes coming out, right? Um, in fact, the most... If you want kids that are really immune to diseases, you'll date somebody overseas because the just differing genes help create like a really kid who's really good at survival or something. Superior child. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's, it's not all Germans or the Nazis and perfect people and stuff. It's it's about. Um, so that was funny. It's, there's enough generations between them and Noah to have health problems between you and it doesn't say that again it's not not what it says it's what it doesn't say um, not just what it says it's also what it doesn't say but, um oh and then the other the last thing that i want to close with is uh, moses got saved by four, four women right now his life was saved already by four women so we think moses is this awesome character but what we don't realize is that zipporah is with him but his whole life and behind every good good man and every good group of men is a good group of women. And so whenever it mentions Moses throughout the rest of Exodus, we know that Zipporah was with him, their family was with him, and all these miraculous signs, it's a group effort. Yeah, it just says Moses in the text, but there was a family behind him, you know, and there's a wife behind him, and and there's all these um, um his sister, his mom. Pharaoh's daughter and that's it. <laughs> so see how Moses is Moses was about to die because of the Pharaoh. Um he was a helpless baby and his mom saved him. And then and his sister put him in the river. So, yeah, her sister walked no his sister watched him. His mom mom put him in the river and his sister watched him. Um oh, I don't the mom told the daughter to go do it. Well, well, we got the <laughs> text here. The daughter was saying to him until he, until he was found by the daughter of Pharaoh. In the cartoon. <laughs> when, I learned better from cartoons. <laughs> now, the mom put him in the basket, put the child in the river. The sister watched him and we got Pharaoh's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other comments? Anything? I actually just realized that uh, something pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah, I became a Christian when I was 19, and that's when I found out that I was allergic to bees. Mm -hmm. But I got stung twice. And At one time? Uh, that day, uh, one on each hand. And I just got the hives like all over my body. And yeah, it was pretty uncomfortable. I mean, they gave me on a scale of one to 10 at four, like um, how much it affected me, the allergic reaction. And, but since then, like I haven't been stung like, once. It's crazy because I've had a lot of close calls. And you're talking about how God saved you from- Yeah, especially when I was wild and firefighting. Like it was oh, very, yeah. it was very evident to me that God was keeping me away from the bees or wasps I should say. And then after that, yeah. like year after year and year, like I would have like a, a near miss. Like I'd kinda of like stumble into like a little one of those small wasps nests, you know, and it's hard to see. Be like, whoa, oh, well, there's one underneath this tarp and I was like fiddling around, you know, working around it. And I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna walk away. Yeah. And uh yeah, I had like close calls like that. For some reason, because before this, before I found out I was allergic, I'd I'd get stung every single year. Mm. It just happened. It was just normal to get stung every year. Now all of a sudden, I don't get stung. I think, I think it's pretty crazy. Thank God. God, he like made it. He made a, he made a covenant. 
between me and the, <laughs> the bees. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so if you walk through this, you will die. Yeah. <laughs> you will die. So, Mark had a good comment. He says, uh, I love that Moses had a speech impediment and was a bad public speaker because God loves to take our weaknesses and use them as strengths for his glory. That, there are these lyrics to the song I like. I think he goes, uh, it's a hip hop song or a rap, but he, he goes, I'm a straight mess. And then he says, uh, but God's doing way more with way less. Mm. I thought it was pretty cool. I'm like, oh yeah. I discovered that actually now. Like I'm starting to discover it that because there's all kinds of areas where I feel like completely weak. Yeah. You know, things that I'm just terrible at, or I give you know, like laziness for one thing. I give into that easily, but that's my weak spot, and that's where God's the most strongest, mm. is where you're most weakest. So I just need to have more faith. Yeah. You know, faith in him and trust in him. Yeah, same thing with uh, with uh, my brain not working completely. God is my my um, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And God can use us. Our weaknesses become a greatest strength. Yeah. We depend on Him to overcome, and we make it better. Yeah. Yeah, let's close in prayer. Right after you read through that New Testament. No, no, I don't. <laughs> what were you looking for? Oh, it's a uh, Gepsi. It's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Timothy. Oh, then I don't know what verse I was looking for. What was it? No, I was going to look for the fruit of the Spirit. Dang. No, I don't know that one. <laughs> we'll look it up. We'll pray and then close. God, I uh, thank you for your word, and um, just thank you for we could all just get together and enjoy our fellowship and enjoy your word. Um, we know that the future's not easy, it's tough, but uh, we know that you'll be with us, and just like you use Moses' weaknesses to, to overcome things, God, you can use our weaknesses, and whenever we might be weak in some areas, but you are strong in those areas, and we depend on you for those, for your strength. Just like it says in the Psalms, just seek your strength continually. So we do that, God, and quietness and peace will be our strength. And we thank you for just the quietness and peace here that we are in the middle class in America. We have so much compared to the rest of the world. And the uh, kings did dream about the conveniences that we have for this day. And uh, so we thank you for um, everything that we have, everything that we will have. And, and just as you say, during our 2011, we're plans to prosper us and give us a hope in the future. And then we start that just by dwelling on your word and we thank you for it. Um, may it change us and change our hearts. And we just thank you for being a good father and for loving us in whatever state we are. And, uh, we know that you will carry us through and we can walk through God's seas, you know, in the park seas for us and to ensure our safety as your children who you love. So we thank you for your love and I pray that you give us a good week and bless our week. May Especially my mom is traveling with the icy, iciness and the snow, 45 minutes. And just just protect her, protect her life, protect um, Mikkel's kids and um, all, all the kids um, and, uh, from the ice and, and everything here. And uh, may it be warm and sunny like in Arizona and just like now, Dad, soon. We thank you for the weather and um, please keep us safe and help us have a good, godly week and you lead us on by your spirit. And uh, just keep us going forward in you, um, despite everything, despite feeling like going backwards sometimes, God. Amen. 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 So, what is it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, right? Mm -hmm. And then Gepsi, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Yep. So that's Ephesians, that's Philippians, you would be back.
Oh, it's oh, it's before. Wait, it's Romans and then Gepsi? Wait, what's yeah. the last chapter before the G? It's Romans, Acts, Corinthians, and then Corinthians. So that's where you're at now. Wasn't it? I thought Acts was before Romans. Yeah, Acts Romans. Oh. oh, is that? Maybe I just misheard you. No, I, I said Romans. <laughs> but I always group them together in my mind. They're like the runoffs of the gospel for some reason. But that's the start of the epistles because Acts is history. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the history. So you have the fifth one is history, both of the Acts of the apostles, the history of Christ and the history of the apostles. Then everything after that. Our writings of Paul and epistles and letters, and then Revelation is like two prophets. So you have the history, the letters, and then prophecy. Anyway, it uh, I learn something more every day. It's good. I'll be able to like organize the books now. So oh, history, is, history is Old Testament, like everything in Old Testament. Well, you're saying? well, no, well, that's that's not New Testament. That we're talking about. The first five books are history. Oh, those are history. Okay. Right. Jesus' time, yeah. Then the letters, which I understand that because it's literally letters to churches. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then Revelation, which is prophecy. Mm. And uh, can I? Oh, yeah, just Google it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, why that was Five, yeah, Jude is a letter. Mm -hmm. All right. Have a great night, Bryce. See you guys.